uh, well, I think the wine might be appropriate for me because I'm going to deliver quite a lot of kind of sobering um, inf information. Um, and uh, I, I also like the point that Gloria made about um, taking the ball that the science has, has placed. Um, all that I can do in this um, presentation is update you climate communicators on um, what's new and, and what I think are some of the critical new issues uh, that, that we've uh, resolved in, in the sciences. Um, and that, that really what needs to happen, as Gloria said, is, is to, um, for the solutions people and the communicators to take that ball from the science and, and move it forward. Um, so uh, this is a selection of climate change top issues for communicators. Um, I'm a professor uh, in glaciology currently in Copenhagen. Um, my background started with 11 years installing and maintaining a network of automatic weather stations on the inland ice sheet of Greenland. And uh, after that um, 11 years at, in, at the University of Colorado, um, I became a, a, an atmospheric science um, and uh, environmental science instructor at the University at Ohio State University. Uh, I was there for 10 years, um, educating uh, physical climatologists of, of the future, let's, let's say. Um, and I basically burned out um, from being a U.S. academic. And, and so I, I took a job in, in Copenhagen uh, supporting the red circles, which are complementary to the network that I helped establish. Um, and so now we're maintaining um, the, this complementary network. And so collectively we have 40 stations on the inland ice sheet of, of Greenland um, that give us really a lot of insight. And over the 25 years that have gone by, um, we've really learned a lot. Uh, our knowledge has greatly expanded, and um, that knowledge gets compiled into thousand-page reports like the IPCC reports, to which I've been the contributing author to the last two reports, and uh, I was a lead author in two chapters of this Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program's uh, synthesis report, and just in the last five years, just on the topic of land ice uh, glaciers, uh, there, we, I, I helped review 350 additional technical um, publications on just land ice, and that was, uh, so the, the science is moving forward, and, and I wanted to share some, some highlights with uh, the climate communicators to, to uh, weaponize you uh, to really um, deliver some really powerful statements. Uh, for example, one of the things that we've just resolved in the last um, decade is that uh, we have now a complete inventory of global land ice, and once you know the, all of the, how much volume of ice there is on the planet precisely, and how it's changing, we have a baseline and we can make conclusions like, in the Arctic, uh, Greenland represents 60%, uh, actually the inland ice sheet 60%, the peripheral glaciers uh, are another 6.4%, so two-thirds of the Arctic sea level contribution is coming from Greenland, and um, uh, Alaska and the, the Canadian Arctic are big players and, and uh, precise statements like that. The last 20 years, Greenland has been contributing twice what um, Antarctica has. Even though Antarctica is nine times the volume of Greenland, uh, Greenland's been melting more. It's in more of a melt regime. Um, Incidentally, that melt from Greenland, it's averaged 280 billion tons the last 12 years, where we have high precision satellite um, gravity measurements. Um, 280 billion metric tons per year. That, let me put that number into more perspective. Um, that's equivalent with uh, 8,000 cubic meters of, of ice per second. Uh, that's the average loss from Greenland the last 15 years. Um, 8,000 cubic meters per second. Um, the, the loss from Greenland alone, um, uh, that divided by all the people on, on Earth, would give all or would give 7.2 billion people um, each 150 liters of water per day, every day of the year. Um, uh, 
that's a bathtub of water for every, equivalent uh, everyone on Earth. So it's still kind of a, an astronomical-ish number, uh, the loss rate from Greenland. And then you add up the others, you add up the other contributors. It's um, equivalent to three millimeters of sea level rise per, per year. And as you'll see, it's accelerating. Um, I wanted to put up some curves that I think you've all seen um, the last 2,000 years. We just have spiking uh, greenhouse concentrations, uh, um, roughly 50% more CO2 in the atmosphere. So as, as, um, as Chris was mentioning already, um, uh, you know, we're 50% above pre-industrial. We're, we're in un uncharted territory already. And, and I have to kind of update these graphics, um, which is uh, kind of alarming. And, I wanted to slip in this 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 um, jab about how a lot of our woes are our consumer culture um, and our non-sustainable lifestyle, um, our commodification of nature uh, and emissions. Um, uh, let's let's not forget cement production is a significant source of CO2. Um, and biomass burning that people are using to clear land. They're actually using fire to clear land. Uh, some of this is natural, but most of it is uh, human set fires. Um, a a short-term uh, kind of agricultural practice, a very one that, that uh, is highly non-sustainable. And then on top of this, people are also harvesting, for, continue to harvest forests. Uh, non-sustainably for uh, palm oil production, for example. I think uh, you know a lot of these details. This is just uh, kind of a, a tragic <coughs> frame uh, with which um, I'm going to lay out some even heavier um, info that you may not already know. Um, when we look at the last 800,000 years, um, we start to get a, a feeling for just how uh, extreme our um, uh, our perturbation to climate has become. Um, CO2 and methane uh, way off the chart. Um, sea level happens to follow these, uh, the last eight ice ages you can see here, um, we had uh, these really large increases in sea level um, because ice uh, disintegrates faster than it accumulates. And so you have this kind of sawtooth pattern where um, fast sea level rise and then slow sea level decline. Um, and that this fast sea level rise that was coming out of the last ice age when you had the disintegration of the ice sheet that's over what's today is Canada, um, and uh, and then relatively stable sea level I'll, I'll talk about. Um, when we compile all of these human caused factors, um, the CO2 is the dominant factor, uh, even though methane is a potent greenhouse gas. There's other uh, warming gases like halo carbons, refrigerants. Um, and uh, there's also cooling factors from human activity. The release of sulfate aerosols um, from the combustion of coal uh, primarily has a cooling effect. Also, uh, it can stimulate cloud development. So you add all these things up and the net effect of human activity is warming, equivalent to uh, a little light bulb like this radiating at 1.6 watts per square meter over every square meter of the planet all the time. That's the, the, the net increase in the warming from, from humans, um, including the uncertainty bars. It could be more than two. Uh, you can get an idea of our level of scientific understanding from, from these whiskers uh, here, but approximately one and a half watts. Uh, a lattice of light bulbs, little one watt, one and a half watt light bulbs radiating additional energy downward uh, over every square meter of the planet's surface, all, um, all every day of the year. Um, so this was an amazing uh, climate reconstruction by Kaufman. It's, it's summer temperatures in the Arctic, and it goes back 2,000 years. So here's time, 2,000 years, and the climate was actually cooling for, the, say, the last 800 years, gradually, in the Arctic summer temperatures, cooling. That's because of orbital changes of the planet. The, the planet has uh, three, four modes of wobble of the, of the, the, the axis of rotation, uh, precession of, of the axes. Um, and, and this, so we were heading into another ice age. It was, it was just a matter of time until uh, we had expansion of, of ice sheets. 
However, the uh, Industrial Revolution, by overloading the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, um, leads to this abrupt warming. Uh, this pattern has been called the hockey stick. Uh, the red line are, are instrumental um, measurements. Um, and what, what surprised me, uh, I, I was like, well, what if no one is, has updated this graphic to include what we expect for the next 100 years for Arctic summer temperatures. And so that's what you're going to see in the next uh, slide. I'm going, you're going to see this graphic uh, plus the next 100 years. Uh, brace yourselves. This is the next 100 years of Arctic summer temperatures, whether we have business as usual, uh, summer warming of six degrees, or uh, a Paris-like uh, climate uh, scenario where we still, in the Arctic in summer, have three Celsius of warming, even in a Paris-like scenario. Um, so clearly we have to raise ambitions, right, to achieve that extremely ambitious one and a half degree target or even better. In, and who knows, we may surprise ourselves. Uh, and that's, of course, being very optimistic. Um, the Arctic, so here's time since 1960, and here's latitude. Here's Antarctica down here. Here's the Arctic. Um, we have more warming in the Arctic than elsewhere. Um, this is called Arctic amplification. And so this makes a disproportionate importance of the Arctic. Um, also that the Arctic um, even though the Arctic is warming, that its impacts radiate globally. Uh, so that, that's an example of the interconnection of the Arctic with the rest of the world, to say the least. Um, I wanted to make this point that, um, for those of you into climate physics, um, the reflectivity is part of Arctic amplification, but uh, there's also uh, temperature-related uh, warming amplifiers. Uh, so it's not just albedo, the whiteness darkening, but this lapse rate feedback is just as large. And when you add together the, the uh, emission, another uh, thermal emission factor in water vapor, the thermal effects actually are stronger than the darkening effect. So when Al Gore shows the, the animation of the sun rays absorbing more and more of the ocean, that's, that's this effect. But um, because of the changing uh, temperature profile in the atmosphere of the Arctic, um, it's, uh, that's actually even more important. That's just another reason why uh, the Arctic is warming at twice the rate of, of the planet in, in, the, in the atmosphere anyway. Um, another point uh, that's interesting, um, okay, so the world is warming. That's illustrated by the red colors. Uh, trend per century to, to Celsius per century. Uh, the continents warm more than the oceans. That's long been expected with, with climate change. Uh, but then there's this conspicuous region of cooling south of Greenland, uh, which this, this study um, concludes that uh, Greenland melting is, re and is responsible for two-thirds of that um, kind of slowdown of the thermohaline circulation. Um, so that, that premise in the, the totally overblown film, The Day After Tomorrow, of the shutdown of the of the North Atlantic uh, circulation, that, that there is a physical precedent to that, but it, it was overblown in the film, and it's actually happening. Um, uh, it's not going to cause global cooling. At, at most, it will cool, um, it'll make for better skiing in Scotland, basically. Um, there, there's, it's not going to make it colder in the Amazon, right? The Amazon, unfortunately, is going to uh, continue overheating with presumably disastrous implications. Um, uh, so I wanted to elaborate more on this um, not very well understood issue of the cold blob in the North Atlantic. Um, and James Hansen, the Paul Revere of climatology, uh, with uh, uh, an impressive uh, list of co-authors, um, publishes a, an epic long study, it's 35 pages of, of uh, dense print, it took me a couple weeks to read it, um, but ice melt, sea level rise, and superstorms. I wanted to show two key elements of that. So in, in a climate simulation, they find um, the models um, estimate an increase in the wind, so the red colors are uh, the change in wind speeds. 
Um, so we, we expect in winter um, intensification of the westerlies in the Atlantic and, and apparently in the Pacific as well, an intensification of, of um, winds. So that's the superstorms element of this. And, and those, those of you who live in the UK will remember the, the, the winter of 2013, I think it was, when, or, or, the, or in, remember in Paris, uh, COP21, the uh, Ireland was flooding uh, at the same time. Uh, so there, there's some recent good examples of that, uh, that um, strengthening of, of, of winds. Um, and this, this study kind of backs that up. Uh, yeah. There's another key element besides, so besides that, which is, I find it really amazingly alarming, is, um, what, so with the cold blob, which, which the, the models here um, simulate, uh, what they did in the studies, they, they, they melted ice really quite, quite fast to get the models to respond, but the freshening of the surface waters is, is what, what basically causes that cooling there. So you're dumping a lot of more ice or fresh water into the ocean system and, and, and fresh water is lighter than salt water. Even though it's colder, uh, it, it floats on top of the salty, warmer water beneath. And, and, and the, 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 the thing about the Antarctic is normally the southern oceans here are a natural uh, a cool, a cooling, the radiative cooling. The, the southern oceans radiate to space. This helps regulate the planet's temperature. The problem when you melt a lot of Antarctic ice is you cap that radiative cooling. And that heat doesn't go away. It simply accumulates um, beneath the, this below about 50 meters depth in the southern oceans. And so an accumulation of heat offshore of the Antarctic ice sheet is an extremely dangerous um, setup. It threatens to destabilize the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, this feedback of increased fresh water, capping, radiative cooling, doesn't cool as much, accumulation of heat right offshore of the Antarctic ice sheet. That, was, that blew my mind. Um, James Hansen's work has consistently been kind of 10, 20 years ahead of, of, of uh, the, the pack, if you will. And, and this study was, was criticized, um, but having read it, in my view, it, it was not um, off, off base. And so this is the, the kind of the risk factor that we face by allowing um, the climate to heat up like, like, like we are or, or are not going forward. Another uh, key um, take home is um, this very, it's actually very um, straightforward thermodynamics that when you heat an, uh, a volume of air, it can hold more moisture. This is uh, well known, it's, uh, uh, and the, the effect is that for every degree of warming, which of course is, is amplified in the Arctic, um, you get kind of 10% increase in, in precipitation. Um, so the Arctic's getting wetter, it's, it's also getting warmer, so that means more rain instead of snow. Um, and, and then the Mediterranean, uh, this also has been long expected that uh, we would see a drying, a drying of the Met, the Mediterranean, so that's, um, that's alarming as well. Warmer, wetter Arctic, drier med, shift of the, the, the weather patterns to the north, it's already uh, being observed. This shows, uh, I published this reconstruction of Greenland mass loss and it, that has been accelerating coming out of the, the Little Ice Age. Uh, not really surprising, um, some Greenland summer temperatures um, the last 170 years uh, increasing by about uh, 2 Celsius. Um, so Greenland, uh, when we get to about one and a half degrees in say 10, 20, 30 years, that's when uh, Greenland's uh, surface mass balance, the, the, just the inputs goes negative. And so you already have a negative budget without accounting for icebergs breaking off. Um, so that's been called the threshold of viability. We cross that for Greenland in say the next 30 years. And then it's, it's, a, it's kind of a dead ice mass and it, it starts to go much faster because of a number of feedbacks. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's something like five amplifiers um, that kick in as, as uh, the more you warm or cool. The amplifiers actually work in reverse. 
So if we can cool climate, we can shut down melt really fast. Um, that's interesting to consider um, because we kind of need to do that, but not just for one or two years like you get with a major volcanic eruption, but for decades or centuries. And that, that would reverse sea level rise um, uh, a, uh, because the feedbacks work in reverse. Um, but these reinforcing feedbacks will uh, will uh, lead to some surprising increases in the loss from Greenland, and that's that's where you get these these nonlinearities. Um, uh, our Dutch friends will notice the Rijksmuseum here, yeah. um, just for scale. And, and so, coming out of the little uh, the last ice age, we have 120, 120 meters of sea level rise. Um, so 20,000 years ago, people could walk from Asia over to North America because sea level was 120 meters lower. Um, then we have this 10,000-year um, period of extremely level, predictable sea level rise, and that's, that really enabled civilization to develop because infrastructure didn't need to be moved. You didn't have to move your ports and your cities and your docks. So like the, the Netherlands and, and their, their strength in, in maritime uh, um, trade uh, was greatly uh, facilitated by the fact that sea level was stable. Uh, so this is a, 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 a way that civilization really gets to, to happen uh, because of climate stability. Farmers could expect uh, the, the certain amount of rainfall to come you know, in more or less the, the, the right period of time. This allowed civilization to uh, develop. That was, we had a very stable climate during what's called the Holocene, and then the Anthropocene kicks in with industrialization, and here's, here are some scenarios um, uh, going forward of, of what we expect. Business as usual will give us uh, 50 meters of sea level rise um, in the next thousands of years. Um, we, we, we probably won't follow this path for a number of reasons, um, but, but a, 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 a kind of conservative, what is this, constant 1990 emissions that um, just helps the, simplify the modeling, still gives us um, some several meters of sea level rise. Um, but the thing is, at 410 parts per million CO2 where we are today, we're already committed to about 10 meters of sea level rise. Um, if we keep the atmospheric CO2 at that level, 410, or if we allow it to go to 450, we're on our way to 450, that's double CO2 mid-century. Um, I, I, I have one slide in the end that talks about, well, maybe we don't get there, and, and so uh, the 10 meters of committed sea level rise, that's hypothetical. Um, we don't know the future, these are scenarios. We cannot predict the future, but we can uh, make uh, informed projections of the future. And that's what this study amazingly beautifully does. Um, 2018, it was first resolved um, that we can now observe an acceleration in, in the very high or the relatively high quality satellite uh, sea sea level altimetry record. Um, so you just see that it's not linear, and we can now have, state with confidence for the first time uh, this year that that our highest quality satellite altimetry data, yes, sea level is accelerating. Um, here's a great uh, reconstruction by um, great scientists. <laughs> they, so this reconstruction, which goes back 2,000 years, resolves um, a sea level rise during the medieval warm period, and a sea level drawdown during the Little Ice Age, and then the instrumental record, and then the Anthropocene, uh, and then a future projection. So uh, this this number is a pretty reasonable uh, to expect by end of century, maybe on the high end, 1.6 meters of sea level rise by the end of the century. Um, and that's already a big problem that I'll talk about uh, briefly. Once, I, I don't think many know this very interesting fact that um, when you remove 300 billion tons per year from Greenland, or um, 180 billion tons from the Antarctic, especially the peninsula, um, the, the, gra the gravity is less. <laughs> when you do that, you know, we're talking billions of tons and, uh, and Newton's laws, uh, all masses attract each other, and when you're talking billions of tons year on year, um, this has a, a, a measurable uh, effect on sea level. Um, 
and so the message is global sea level rise is not uniform. It doesn't go up exactly 1.6 meters everywhere. It, it, it goes up 1.6 meters ends of the century plus 50% in this region. So in, in that part of the world, they, they have, say, two and a half meters, three meters of sea level rise in Jakarta, in the Philippines, in Bangladesh. Um, the sea level rise, just from the gravitational influence, is, is concentrated in the tropics. Um, Sorry, will it change the tilt of the Earth as well, then, by moving all the water away? Mm. They don't know? No, no the, the rotational axis, there's so much angular momentum that that, that, that won't change. But what, what does change is the, the rotation period. So it takes, you know, 8,000... 86,400 seconds for the Earth to rotate, that, that does um, slow down. Um, and that's perceptible. And, and when the north, if you have a lot of snow in the north and, and a lot of rain on, the, on, on Australia, for example, this is detectable in the rotation period of, of the planet. So we will have more time during the day. Yes. It's a good <laughs> yeah. And actually, the, the moon is stealing uh, angular momentum from the Earth, so the days are getting longer from the moon. But these are these are, are irrelevant on human time scales. So we can do even um, more damage. Yeah. yeah. And that's, 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 the inter that. <laughs> that's the interesting thing about you know climate change. That was, we, were, we were cooling, cooling, cooling. Um, that was hardly relevant on human time scales. And then the industrialization. That that's we start to kind of compress time. Because we don't know the future, we have to think about probability, uh, probabilities. So there's the middle probability in, in uh, Jakarta, in a two degree warming uh, by mid-century, uh, I think this is mid-century, uh, is say 20 centimeters of sea level rise. Uh, not including local subsidence because Jakarta's lost uh, more than a meter, by the way, um, just by pumping water out of land that's um, so big asterisk there because um, they have Indonesia has it there okay um, but there's a let's go to four degrees because it's, it's you can see the nonlinearity you go from um, a, a median probability of, of 60 centimeters of sea level rise um, to a five percent chance um, of, of much more say twice that so there's there's a small probability that, say, parts of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet are something that we hadn't thought of, and, and, and we have been surprised over and over and over and over again in, in my experience. So the, these probabilities reflect that there may be some um, unknown unknowns, um, and they try to account for known unknowns. Uh, so it's a very clever study um, that, that comes up with this to try to gauge um, uncertainty or deep uncertainty. How, how much a period of time that's... Well, it, it's actually, it doesn't, it's, it's not it's time dependent, it's, it's whenever we hit two degrees or four degrees. Okay. Uh, which is actually um, kind of um, illustrated by business as usual versus roughly Paris. And so mid-century doesn't, there's not a big difference between these curves. They really start to diverge end of century. So we don't know when we're going to hit two degrees globally. And that's, that's what's kind of clever about their study, they, they remove that and they say whenever we hit two degrees, this is what Jakarta and Hong Kong and Lagos and Hamburg um, and <laughs> their study has uh, two pages of, of all the major cities in the world because sea level is, is, is not, is more coast, it, it differs coastal than in the open ocean and it's a, um, but I'm talking about, you know, mid-century, end of century and I, in my final slides, I'm, I'm, I want to make this point that we don't have to wait until mid-century, end of century to feel expensive impacts already. Um, the New York Times proclaiming that the era, era of global sea level or sea level rise has begun. That was two, a couple of years ago already. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, um, okay, expensive extreme events already. Uh, Superstorm Sandy happens, um, so an expensive extreme event um, occurs because of the combination of multiple um, things stacking up. In, this, in Sandy's case, it was storm surge um, plus high tide. 
uh, or storm surge multiplied by high tide, multiplied by sea level rise due to thermal expansion. So that's four factors. Um, the the east, east coast of the U.S. has something like 40% more sea level rise just due to thermal expansion. Then there's land subsidence because that might not be such an issue for Manhattan, but but when you stack up, um, you you flood the New York subway and you you that costs New York 60 billion dollars. And it was kind of an overnight, very fast event. So you get that um, with sea level rise um, when you're not lucky. Um, when you're what? Uh, and fascinating was this, this uh, when was this, in March of this year, uh, Boston floods because of storm surge, that's the, the winds pushing the water on shore, plus, sea level, plus high tide. Um, so this graphic, and this is expensive, right? When your car gets flooded with salt water, that totals your car, right? So this, this is happening today already. And so the storm, so the high tides, the normal tide, you have high and low tide every day. Um, this was storm surge, the, the orange line here, plus high tide, gave them record high, 10, 10 feet, three meters, two and a half meters of sea level, boom, just, just like that, because of storm surge and plus high tide, plus, thermal expansion due to global warming plus sea level rise. Um, sea level rise ensures that we'll get more of this. Uh, I'm gonna wrap for the final slide here is that, um, and so then enters the politics. Um, New York City is, is suing Shell, Exxon, taking them to court. We call this litigate to mitigate. Uh, and it's happening and I, it occurs to me that, that reality is stranger than fiction. Um, this is the cli-fi of today. Uh, and uh, so uh, I flooded you with information. I hope you retain some of this. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll share the slides. Uh, thanks for your